to Australian Musician. Thank you. Uh, tell me when you first uh, become interested in electronic music. For me, it was when I was a young kid. Uh, I grew up in a town called Bacchus Marsh, which is about 45 minutes north of Melbourne, and grew up on a small hobby farm up there. And a neighbour actually was a thoroughbred breeder and uh, a bit of a punter. And when he'd have a big win on the horses, he'd buy his kids lavish gifts. This is probably about the early 1980s. And I was friends with his kids, and so I used to ride on my BMX over to their house, and one day I turned up there, and uh, the young fellow said, oh, come and have, check this out. My dad bought me a synthesizer. So I went to his bedroom, and there's this uh, Roland Juno 60, and um, I, uh, I was just like blown away. I put the headphones on, and I started playing the synthesizer, and I just thought, oh, that's it for me. Like, this is all I want to do for the rest of my life. So I was probably about seven or eight at the time, and uh, that's all I've ever done since, is just work in electronic sound and music. Yeah. So who are some of the artists that have influenced you? Oh, look, um, it's a pretty broad range of people. I think in those early days, I wasn't exposed to a lot of different music. So, you know, probably the classics like, you know, Jean-Michel Jarre and um, people like that. Um, and then later on, a little bit of Tangerine Dream and bands like that that I heard. But then... Um, also as a young kid too, I think I kind of had pretty conservative music tastes, like I used to think you had to be pretty hardcore to listen to ACDC or something like that. And, um, and then when I went to school I had a music teacher there who turned me on to sort of all of this avant-garde 20th century music which completely blew my mind because it just sounded so crazy and so psychotic and weird and strange and, and all of a sudden it made all of this stuff when I was listening to heavy metal I thought oh you know that suddenly became really a big pantomime compared to like how crazy a lot of this atonal music was. So then I was really influenced by a lot of people in that world. So particularly like uh, the French composer and thinker, a guy called Pierre Schaeffer, who sort of laid the groundwork for what's called music concrete, which you know basically is a sort of underpinning a lot of like contemporary sound design, but also electronic music generally. Yeah. Uh, fast forward to now, mm. and you're running the uh, Melbourne Electronic Sound Studio. Yeah. Um, tell me how that came about. Um, so myself and my co-director Robin Fox, um, we'd met each other working in sort of experimental music around Melbourne. And um, as you do, you kind of talk about different things to do with music and what's happening and things that are going on. And I'd uh, taught at RMIT for a long time and I was a little bit disappointed by how I thought that large institutions and universities were supporting electronic music. And Robin and I kind of bonded over our love of electronic music, but also over the equipment and also something too of like <clears throat> the early earliest years of electronic music, we used to have these big workshops where people would come down and they weren't really studios, like a recording studio, and they were kind of places where it was technicians and musicians and composers and kind of almost like non-musicians as well, all kind of working in the same space. So things like the BBC Radiophonic Workshop, we thought, wouldn't it be great to have a space like that in Melbourne, which was independent, where people could come down and make electronic music, regardless of genre or regardless of whatever they were doing? And so we hatched a plan and thought, well, yeah, maybe we could open a studio that was like that, open a small place that worked in that way. And we took a lot of inspiration from independent radio as well, so places like 3RRR and PBS FM. And um, around the same time, I'd, um, my career has been kind of quite extensive and very eclectic. But uh, I had an acquaintance with um, Wally DeBacker, so Gautier, because uh, I'd worked as a mastering engineer with um, Frank Titaz, who'd produced Wally's record. Um, so from Wally's first record through to the big success that he had with um, his Blast record. And um, because of Wally's success, he had suddenly uh, started buying like all of these vintage synthesizers, like all these obscure pieces and whatnot. And he'd also uh, moved to New York simultaneously and it was around the same time Robin and I were hatching this idea and so we sat down with Wally and said well look you know you've got this huge collection like why don't you let us try and make it available to the public through a not-for-profit organization so that people could get their hands on some of these amazing pieces and also so that those instruments could keep being used because I think with electronics you know if they sit around in a in a, in a shed or a cupboard for too long then they kind of they rust away like they are literally corroding away they're a bit like if you had a classic car collection like you got to take it around the block every couple of weeks to keep it running um, and at the same time to that as well uh, Melbourne University had just restored their epic Synthy 100 which is a massive electronic music instrument right from the very early days and incredibly rare one of only 33 ever made I think it is and uh, at the relaunch of that instrument, we ran into another fellow who said, oh, there's another guy out there uh, by the name of Tony Osmond, who's another musician and um, artist. 
uh, and he has a huge collection as well. Um, and so you should go and talk to him. So we went and talked to Tony and it turns out Tony had this massive collection of like polysynths and all these other things. And then, so Robin and I had like modest collections and Robin had, in, Robin had inherited a collection of his own from um, the Australian composer Keith Humble. And so that basically formed the bedrock of like mess. So then we just got to work and started to open the place up. So it's a bit of a roundabout story, but um, it's a sort of confluence of lots of different things kind of coming together at the same time to enable us to make mess happen. <laughs> Do you have a, a favourite piece here? Oh, that's pretty hard. It's like saying who's your favourite kid, you know, if you've got if you're a parent, who's your favourite child. Um, they're all pretty amazing, like, you know, and, and I think very much like a lot of things in music, as your mood changes, so does your kind of favourite instrument. So, you know, in your particular mood to make some nasty music, there's some synths here that are really a bit kind of crazy and brutal. And then other times you feel like, oh, I'm a bit more of a mellow mood. I, I want to, you know, make something that's a bit smoother and a bit nicer. In fact, the Moog System 55 behind me here is probably a good instrument for that. It's very clean, very kind of rich sounding instrument. So yeah, it's very hard to pick favorites, but uh, the good thing about Mess is that as those moods change, there's a synthesizer in here for almost every situation and mood, I think. Um, what kind of maintenance does gear like this require? Yeah, maintenance was a very big concern of ours when we first started out. Um, we were a bit worried that we'd open mess and all of a sudden, after two weeks, we'd just have a room full of broken synthesizers because some of them are quite frail. A lot of them were built kind of quite cheaply in order to make them affordable. So, um, and some of them were built magnificently like the System 55 behind us here. Um, so some of them were built to last, some of them weren't built to last. And um, trying to find people who are like synthesizer technicians was a little bit of a task ahead of us. Um, uh, not to sort of uh, demean people that like fix synthesizers and stuff, but we did find that like sometimes a lot of people who were smart enough to like fix synthesizers and no electronics were also smart enough to know they didn't want to do it full time. So uh, what we ended up finding was we had a bit of a brains trust and so people who worked in broadcasting, people who worked in telecommunications and other people just started to come out of the woodwork as we got the word out there. Um, and so that's how we started off and then as we went down the track we ran into another gentleman by the name of Morgan McWaters who makes his own modular um, synthesizers like contemporary Eurorack modular synthesizers under the name Wrong. And um, Morgan came to us and he was doing his electronics degree at the time and was very interested in the field and was, was ready to start working for us. So Morgan um, is our in-house technician and takes care of uh, maintaining a lot of the synthesizers and stuff ourselves. Uh, we don't really offer it to people outside to fix synthesizers because we've got enough work on our hands as it is. But it's very much a case of like as little things go wrong and they do go wrong, we just fix the minor issues as they crop up um, as compared to say like if these things yeah, sit in a storeroom for two or three years, sometimes you turn them on and they need you know, a big renovation, like maybe the power supply needs to be rebuilt. And so what could be a small task suddenly becomes a very big task if these things don't get used. So what sort of people come through here? Look, it's a massive eclectic mix of people really. Like, um, uh, we've had like lots of different international artists already. We've only been open for three years, so we've had lots of international artists come through. Um, we had the guys from Survive, who are also known for doing the soundtrack for Stranger Things, they came through. Uh, we had Alessandra Cortini, who works uh, with Nine Inch Nails and performs with Nine Inch Nails. So Alessandra came through, did some workshops and teaching for us and made some music on some of the machines here. Uh, we had another um, artist named Sarah Davachi, who's kind of quite a great um, electronic music artist in her own right. We also had uh, Caitlin Aurelia Smith, who's also a well-known electronic musician from California. Um, and we also had a, um, a, a, a legend of electronic music, a woman by the name of Suzanne Chiani, who came through as well when she was touring Australia. Suzanne's now in her 70s, but she started off um, in the early days of electronic music, soldering uh, modules for, for Don Buchler and the Buchler Synthesizer Company and uh, went on to have like a very kind of incredible career working a lot in advertising and film and um, she's also sort of known a little bit as the sort of uh, one of the key artists who um, created the emergent style of new age music I guess like easy listening electronic music so pianos and synthesizers mixed together and um, Suzanne's a real force like and she's 
just recently be coming back out and doing all these shows and playing these brilliant live electronic music shows. So that's just a small sample of some of the people that we've had through here in, of note. But then from the community, it's just a, a super wide range of people. So we have yeah, people from avant-garde and experimental work. We have people making techno, hip hop, like pretty much anywhere that someone's making electronic music or anywhere where technology and music sort of intersect. They, they often come in here to mess to do bits and pieces and work on their projects or participate in some of the workshops and things that we run here. Yeah. So can people just rock up or you need to uh, become a member? How do, how do you use the... You can, do it, you can do it both ways. When we first opened it was only to members um, and that's because we are, we are a not-for-profit organisation and as I said earlier we kind of took a lot of inspiration from community radio so the members really are the underpinning of a lot of the way that we finance and keep the lights on and pay our staff and do all those things here at Mess and pay for some of the maintenance. Um, and so people buy a membership and that could be $200, that's $200 a year. Um, and they get a free session when they first join up and the sessions go for four hours. It's like 40, 40 bucks for four hours, so it's 10 bucks an hour to come down and use these machines. Um, but then also people, who are non-members can also come down and work on the synthesizers. It's a little bit more expensive to cover the gap that they're not becoming members. But um, all the time, uh, Robin and myself and all the other staff members here at MESA are working hard to build it into an organisation where we can actually make it even more affordable all the time. Because really what lies at the heart of MESS is access, like giving those people as much access as possible. And um, when we first started out, we're just at the end of this three year period that we're calling our incubation period to test the model of the business and to see how it would work and to see what the demand was. And now we're at that point where we've got like a great m amount of momentum behind us. And so we're really looking forward to um, pushing ahead and being able to offer even more to our members and hopefully to offer membership and access to the general public um, even more cheaply than we do at the moment. MESS will be open uh, and part of activities for the Melbourne Synth Festival. Mm -hmm. uh, what opportunities does that present for people coming down to the Synth Festival? I think that um, it let people who maybe don't know about us and who are maybe just curious about synthesizers in general see some of the more historic pieces that we have in the collection. Like there are pieces here in the collection that tell a very important story about Australia's connection to the development of electronic music. Um, we have some super rare items here um, that are all functioning instruments. And so we're going to bring some of those instruments out into the general public areas of the Synth Festival that people can interact with and muck around. And we'll also be running some tours through MESS as well so that people can see what we're doing, have a look at the space, have a look at the collection and um, just sort of, uh, I guess, come to grips with like what we're trying to do here at MESS and hopefully come on board to support what we're doing and become part of the growing community around MESS. All right, Byron, thanks for your time. Great, thank you.